sense of the committee felt wasn't wasn't covered enough or that questions were raised that we didn't talk about um so my my three my three favorite quotes the first is the biggest risk is in not using ai um the ai presents all sorts of opportunities to do a better assessment uh and not using it at all would be like having all your investments be a, a low interest rate savings account. Um, you're missing out on on a, a, some positive opportunities that that um, that present themselves. Uh, the second is AI tools can't be authors, um, and the the converse of that or the contrapositive of that for the assessment is only human experts can assess the literature. Um, so we all understand that that role of the human intelligent expert um, is paramount and and nothing of of what we've discussed would would uh, would diminish that, but rather give give those experts extra tools to be effective. And the third uh, was use AI intelligently. Uh, and the notion of what it means to use it intelligently is is the focus of this meeting. So a couple of general principle uh, uh, that we principles that we discussed. Um, well, first of all, we didn't really agree on um, or, or move toward a list of of principles. Um, Stephen compiled the breakout group uh, discussions into a slide, which we'll show uh, shortly. Um, but we're we're not quite there. So that's one of the things that maybe there there would be more opportunity for dis discussion. Um, a starting point on principles would be what do we want to achieve? Um, there are a number of opportunities that present themselves, um, which I'll come to when we talk about the uh, uh, application. But um, one of the interesting points that a speaker made yesterday was that AI can sort of augment our creativity or challenge our thinking and to be more effective just as a as a thought partner. So so how can that be used? Is, is that sort of the big the beginnings of, of a principle about AI. Um, the next uh, set of topics that I organized this under is, is about application. How do we actually apply? Uh, we heard a lot of ways that AI could be used responsibly to increase the effectiveness of the assessment process. And maybe we could put up Kordaji's slide with the matrix. Um, so the, 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 maybe the low hanging fruit would be to take over the tedious and cumbersome tasks like verifying links or checking for cross chapter consistency, um, identifying and summarizing literature, evidence mapping, uh, detecting bias, which might be related to evidence mapping. And then at the, at the, the final end, uh, you know, after the assessment is, is uh, completed to transmit and access uh, the report and engage users. Um, these these applications, you know, I think there there was a lot of interesting suggestions here, but we didn't really have time to go into how they would actually be used. Um, so the guidance that NCA leadership provides to authors needs to go beyond just you know don't use LLMs to write your final text, but really to equip authors to be effective. And we didn't really kind of think about how to do that. You know, the, the, the easy or the simple suggestion of having an AI expert in the TSU um, seems promising. Um, evidence mapping is a, a, an intriguing feature, but, you know, we don't really understand how it would work. It'd be great to sort of work through an example with an author team. Um, and you know clearly the the pitfalls. Um, no conversation about AI is complete without talking about the pitfalls and the warning signs. But again, it needs to go beyond the warning signs and really translate that into the um, the actionable working space of NCA authors. Um, so watch out for this kind of thing. The the cow on the beach example. Um, I don't know how to translate the cow on the beach example into NCA language, but, um, uh, and, uh, you know, is the goal of, of using AI to save time? Probably not, unless you're Fred Lipschultz clicking through every link. Um, but, you know, maybe it can help authors be more effective. Um, but uh, again, sort of, yeah, I'm, the rest of this was, I've already said. 
um, how will the process evolve as AI evolves? So, you know, two years ago, we had never heard of Chad GPT, most of us. And two years from now, uh, what will the velocity of change in this space uh, take us to? Um, there was an intriguing discussion about intuition, uh, which I'll come back to. Um, see, that's a repeat of what I already said. Um, if, if there's an interest in sort of evaluating the the um, in the effectiveness of using AI through this process, it would probably now is the time to think about what information you would need to start collecting in order to make that evaluation. That is also something that we didn't really talk about. Um, this is sort of a, a, a final point that doesn't really fit in the, any category, but it's an intriguing notion that USGCRP could actually influence the development of AI tools like Semantic Scholar. Um, and the fact that somebody from Semantic Scholar was here um, paying attention to how an assessment is different from regular conduct of science, uh, I think is a, a great opportunity. Uh, we were talking in the closed session about some of the blind spots of Semantic Scholar, their entire swaths of literature. It doesn't incorporate, you know, maybe this is an opportunity for USGCRP to say, we really need Semantic Scholar to include uh, literature about demographics, um, a, lot, a lot of other examples. 221 million is a really large number. So I was alarmed to find that there are swaths of literature that are missing, but USGCRP may actually have an opportunity to improve that. Um, here, here's under, under my section of what's missing or needs further discussion. We're still developing the values and principles regarding AI, um, but maybe there's sort of a, a hierarchy that, you know, that builds directly on the principles of the, the NCA. Um, for instance, you know, it has to be trustworthy. It has to meet the, the standards of HISA. Obviously, you've thought that far, but what are what are some other um, uh, principles that we might agree on? Um, evidence maps, uh, again, seems like a promising um, tool or aspect of AI uh, that could help chapters really figure out um, what they need to cover, identify gaps either in their thinking or in the literature, but we need to learn more about what those are. Um, what, what is the role of intuition? This was sort of a disturbing uh, topic that came up yesterday that, that you know, in, in our supposedly objective science, um, scientists, you know, use intuition, which is subjective. Uh, does that happen in assessment? Can we provide guidance for assessment? Is there a way that AI can challenge our intuition uh, or, or make us be more explicit about how we're weighing evidence in assessing? Um, how, how can AI help the next assessment accomplish things that it wouldn't otherwise accomplish? The, 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 think about the funnel of literature coming in, getting ever wider, uh, without AI, we would certainly miss a lot of literature. But um, to, so it seems like that's something that it enables that otherwise we couldn't do very effectively. Um, every time the word risk was mentioned yesterday, it was about the reputational risk to USGCRP. And we, we also want to focus on, you know, the actual threat that climate change poses to the nation and its its residents, both human and non-human. And so thinking about doing an effective assessment as a way of communicating risk of, of that kind, you know, we, we're sympathetic to the risks that uh, USGCRP is is facing, um, it, you know, heading into the, the NCA. Um, one possible way that AI could help mitigate the risk is to do sort of a pre-review um, before a public review and sort of flag things that may you know, th that, that may be vulnerabilities or, or gaps. Um, we were wondering whether there are interagency differences in policies about AI that will come into play and, and you know, what, what role that, that might have. And that is, that concludes my recap and wondering.
Thank you, Phil. We're not really going to open it up for a broad conversation right now because we're about to go into some smaller groups conversations um, that will then lead into a broader conversation. But Ariella, I didn't give you a heads up on this, but I'm wondering if you are coming into day two with some questions or topics um, that you heard in day one that are problematic or intriguing that that you would invite us in our smaller groups to spend some more time on or Stacy any anybody from the USGCRP team um, who wants to bring in some topics and questions Mike wants Mike want to say something but I can start anyway um so thank you for that Phil I was thinking about many of the same questions I'm a little bit nervous as we move into NCA6, where one of the priorities is really integrated sciences to make sure that we're telling a comprehensive, robust story that includes different kinds of science, not just the physical science, but the qualitative social sciences, other ways of knowing, gray literature, adaptation plans, um, you know, indigenous knowledge in a real way, integrated, not piecemeal. When the big tools that exist bias towards one kind of science, and we spend all our time talking about how to do this kind of research, does that push the authors in that direction itself? So I'm a little bit worried about sort of the bigger space in which this happens and the priority we're putting on a tool that prioritizes a certain kind of knowledge. So that's one question I was thinking about on the way here. Um, another is, I was really struck by the importance of training authors on how to use the tools in order to get what you want out of it. And there was two parts of that 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 um, were not red flags, they're like yellow flags, like how do we do this kind of flag? Um, one is, are the tools prepared for the kinds of questions that we want to ask, the sort of nitty gritty about specific topics, and would we end up spending a lot of time trying to get something from a tool that maybe is not prepared to give us that answer? That's one question. The other is how do we give direction across so many diverse teams who are thinking about diverse issues in ways that doesn't put a burden on the program? And I think an AI person is great, but let's not beat around the bush. It's really hard to resource staff. It's not a simple thing. Um, and it's, we're late in the game. I, we have three years left, you know, three years and three months, something like that. You know, we're not, we're very far ahead. That might not seem like a lot. Maybe that seems like a lot to you, but it's not. It is not a lot of time. Every day matters to us. So I, I don't know how to think about this for NCA six, but I am thinking about it as laying the groundwork for NCA seven. I don't know if that misses the boat. I, these are questions I was thinking about on the way. I don't know if we're gonna be too behind, but I also don't know if we're far enough to implement the kinds of guardrails that would allow us to do this properly um, and, and to influence like semantic scholar, that might take two years. And then by that point, we're well beyond <laughs> new literature. So, you know, there, there is a timing and resource question here that, that has been on my mind as I heard some of those uh, flags, but it doesn't mean that I'm not interested in learning how we can set it up for the next. I just am not positive knowing what needs to happen that we're at the right place. Okay, go to small groups and think about that. <laughs> well, well, before we leave, I, just in response to that, one of Bill brought up the the need to perhaps ex experiment, evaluate now for later, and that if you're going to do that, you kind of have to think about that right on right now. Three years is part of that, so that at the end of the current one, you have some evaluation experience and that might assist you in going forward. Yeah, that's a great idea. And, and I agree. It would be interesting maybe to hear from you all, where would be like the smaller spaces where we can experiment? What is the place where we can compare something that we already do really well with what would happen if we used AI that also doesn't put a burden on the authors while they are working? So what can we do in house to sort of parallel that um, would be an interesting experiment. Um, super, that actually fits right with what we're planning for our engagement sessions, but I wondered, was there any other, um, Stacy or Mike, any, any other um, contributions? Um, great. No, those, the, that's really helpful as we're seeking to support you in, in what you all need to do. So, um, Sarah, do you want to? 
Yeah, so this is great. So in our small groups, we're really hoping that the discussions are about what those ex uh, salient experiences um, and tests and opportunities might be for us. And we wanted to encourage reflection both on what you've heard um, and across the sort of stages of the NCA around the opportunities um, and sort of like mini experiments we might want to do now to help stage for the future. Um, so you can think about either the, the stages of the NCA or the work across chapters or any of these concerns that have been raised. Um, and in your groups, you'll be um, thinking about um, what the AI applications, opportunities, concerns, and challenges are in generating them. But please pay attention. Like if you think things are particularly fruitful, you might um, also try to capture what that conversation is so it can be shared out, especially considering this navigation of what to what test to prioritize. Um, and so the small groups will both generate um, ideas on mini experiments and then thinking about those experiments what would that mean we need to ask from the AI tool developers like semantic scholars or others that are developing tools? So um, in order for them to get better thinking about your experiments, what would the things that we would wanna ask of the uh, developers, um, what kinds of uh, assessment needs do we have um, that need to be embodied in tools and things like that? So we have time. Um, I have the rule, maybe we can put the rules yeah, up for I, the slides. Uh, okay, sorry in the process of <laughs> yeah so there's the table again and and um you can look at things that have been you can think about things that have been said so far or things that were said in your groups yesterday but we're really trying to capture the things that are most salient for um the different stages um uh and the examples are just there as an illustration but really we've heard a lot more um through our discussions yesterday so think about the things that have come up and what priorities might be um and then We'll be going into these groups, and I'm going to share the rules next. If, um, I don't know if you want to share the next slide, um, so you can look at the sort of principles that we, or think about the principles that we heard and yesterday from the speakers, and in, in the that you identified for the stages yesterday, um, and then. Um, have a discussion about what the opportunities are that you see in AI development across stages, informed by these principles. Um, and we also know that there's this need to keep the guidance current as the state of AI technology and tools advances. So it's also it's managing both what to do first and what's most important and how to ensure um, that we keep current as things continue to evolve. Um, and then, so that's sort of the first part of what you're asked is to discuss and describe these opportunities. And then the second part is to think about what AI tool developers need to know from us to improve their process. So we'll, we'll um, the, when you get in, we're gonna break into two groups in here and then one big two, group. Two, oh, okay. two online, we've got a big online. Oh, and two online, okay, great. So we'll have two online groups. And um, again, please select, the first thing you should do is select a moderator um, who will help make sure that you grab perspectives from across whoever's participating in your group. And then a reporter who's ready to share back some of these things. We know that there will be really fruitful conversation that especially related to what we just heard are near needs. So hoping to capture things in that and reporting out that really are helpful um, in moving this work forward. Um, uh, so yeah, you'll spend, after you've assigned your folk, uh, your people, spend a little bit of time reflecting a little bit on this individually and then have a discussion in your group and work to sort of fill in some ideas into that table. Yeah. Anything else? And really, um, the principles that we're uh, that we brought from yesterday are really a touchstone. Um, we're hoping that they inform the conversation, and I think hopefully we're interesting, useful uh, principles not only for thinking about AI, but any of the other things that we are doing about reaching out into a broader groups and broader literature um, to um, as a number of the conversation. Uh, presenters said in yesterday afternoon is you really need to know where why you're going someplace to, to inform how you're going there and so um, the principles are are sort of a language that we're hoping can be used but don't be bound so much by that i really would uh, encourage you to take ariella's um question and request um directly of what what are the things that we can start with uh testing now and and playing with now in a way that 
enhances, helps us think forward about the process, um, and then, uh, but is not sort of throwing big wrenches into the works of something that's already up and running. Um, and then we had a conversation earlier this morning also about what are the things within AI that AI is only, and you can really only do with AI uh, versus what are some things that are um, that are nice, nice to haves. And so again, don't need to tag everything there, but worth also identifying what are some of those things that increasingly that is a necessary partner in the process. Um, so we'll I put a link in the in the chat to the worksheets that we'll be um, using. Also included in the worksheet um, is um, is a summary of the principles and the experiences that from all of the groups yesterday. So you can have that as a reference. Um, and um, we have. Um, we have just about a little under an hour um, and for for the small groups to talk and then we'll come back and report out there and that is then both some time to talk as a group but really setting up for um, what are some of the key conversations that we want to have in our final hour this after lunch um, and um, so we we have the um, virtual groups are, are going to happen automatically and we're going to do the same thing that we did yesterday and uh, count off by twos today. Um, we'll both meet in this, both of those groups will meet in um, this room or um, so at one either end of the table um, and uh, Julie, I'll have you start off again. Um, One, two, oh. one. There. So um, at this point, um, we will we will break and uh, we'll come back um, together as a group um, at eleven thirty in um, in DC time and Eastern time, and uh, for report outs. Once again, please have be prepared to uh, report from your group um, to the the broader group when we come back. And uh, so ones. Here, ones will come down this side and twos at, at that end. And um, we look forward to hearing outcomes of your conversations. Any questions before we break? Great. So um, you're asking for group one to read out? Yes. Okay. Oh, thank you. Um, so um, our group had a nice conversation about a, a, a broad amount of things and some of the challenges that we noted and considerations that we noted were um, sort of the roles of um, AI as a creative partner versus a co-author and how sometimes it was useful to use AI in the creative space um, and that there are promising tools that are helpful in parts of the scoping but not all of the, of the scoping. Um, we thought that it would be good to run experiments of producing parts of the NCA, like a very small chapter or a question within the NCA using AI and not using AI. We thought another um, useful activity would be to um, uh, ask the authors how they would have used AI in the previous NCA um, and why, and explore some focus group questions on what they would have done um, as the users of, of, as the creators of the NCA, and that that could also be done for um, the folks after they get to the um, later in the process in this process. Um, and then uh, there are some real good uses of. AI that might be around um, the input process and filtering spam um, and filtering um, high quality information versus um, lesser quality information if you could set guardrails on it. Uh, let's see, other things that came up. I Am I missing anything big? There were a few more things, but I just wondered if, if the group thought I should mention more. No. Okay. I would say one thing, Sarah, just the um, importance of timing in all of this and, okay. you know, what we actually reasonably have time to do before 
before too late. So we did talk talk about that a bit. Right. Yeah. Okay, group two. Or group one. <laughs> group one. <laughs> group one. Wait, I I took that. We'll do it backwards. <laughs> Are we group one? Yeah. Okay. Yes. No. Sorry. Good. Then, um, yeah, we were tasked with thinking about writing and figure configuration and also the review stages. We sort of bucketed this into the, the way that you had it organized on the slide, which is general, a general conversation around opportunities and constraints using artificial intelligence and then some slightly more targeted uh, um, uh, unsolicited advice to USGCRP. So um, we, when we started discussing writing, there was uh, at the beginning of that conversation, uh, a lot of focus on the uh, issues around the tension between the scientific literature and other forms of literature that we really need to include, like the social science literature, and, and also forms of evidence that may not have been swept up into machine learning training algorithms uh, we we heard from Sarah about the fact that in the social sciences, uh, there's information that appears in books, in films, uh, in, in other forms that may not have been as easily vacuumed up by traditional machine learning algorithms. So there's an, uh, the, so in the literature, in terms of the writing side, and coming back to um, Phil's point about the funnel, um, you know, the, the tension is right now how to make sure that the the funnel isn't really skewed to one side toward uh, the physical sciences, sciences literature. Um, and F Phil did also mention that in just in, because time is of the essence here, it might be useful to think through, um, you know, guidance that could be issued now uh, in preparation for the early work by the author teams about how to approach uh, machine learning when performing literature surveys. So complementing semantic search engines with other forms of literature search just to make sure that they are not biased and but also making best use of ML AI. So that was, we, we spent a fair amount of time discussing that. Then we pivoted, I think a little bit more into opportunity space around writing. Um, and I'll come back to where we may have landed there, but there were some things that were brought up that um, you know, for example, level setting around the appropriate leadership uh, level. So the report is supposed to be written at a freshman level, college freshman. I don't write at that level. So if you, you know, the first text I would spit out would not be at that level. Level setting there. Uh, another place where it seemed like it would be, uh, machine learning could be extremely helpful would be harmonization with the glossary. So this is a, a very thankless task, looking at all the reserved words in the report and making sure they're being used consistently. That could be done quite presumably quite quickly by machine learning. Uh, rapid first pass translation into other languages, again, done almost instantaneously, effectively by machine learning. So those things all uh, with humans going back and correcting all the, the translational mistakes understood. Um, several of us discussed the idea of doing this as experiments. So they're essentially not in the critical path, but being done perhaps as a feed forward to NCA7 so that you're not, you're not, you know, this isn't gumming up the works, um, but it could be done w w um, perhaps to see what w might work best. Uh, we then pivoted, sorry, Stephen, I'm, I'm gonna try to keep myself on time. Um, we then pivoted to figures. So there are, there are several things that are moderately thankless about figure production, making sure the figures are style compliant, making sure that they are uh, safe for, um, uh, view, uh, viewers who may have a style, uh, uh, vision, either vision impairment or, or color blindness. Uh, so ch that kind of check is might be very helpful. Um, I don't know to what extent NCA is making sure that all the figures are inherently reproducible, but that's another very thankless task that IPCC 6 undertook. Uh, and then the third is somehow evaluating the figures against um, non-subject matter experts. That again was an uh, can be a very time consuming process. Can that be automated? Um, and that sort of covered the first phase of general thinking about writing and uh, figure configuration and review stages. 
We then pivoted uh, to thinking more about the USG, UC, uh, USGCRP in particular. So um, began focusing a little bit more on the TSU, perhaps as the critical locus here. Um, Leslie mentioned some of the challenges in the later stages of the report are on pulling through cross chapter threads to highlight up front, could that be automated? Um, and again, that could be fairly easily checked. So I think there's um, high benefit, low risk there. <coughs> um, I, I think that uh, we do think that a section needs to be added to the methods appendix. And whatever you do with the machine learning, you need to document that. Um, so if you decide to use it de minimis or you know full on, but why these decisions were made, because I think people will will obviously want to know. Uh, and whatever you you know whatever choice is made, I think it's great. But just explaining this is being done in the context of a rapidly changing field, tight time constraints, a bunch of other constraints in the system that you weren't you know at the liberty of an undergraduate and writing a term paper. I think would be helpful for people to know because some people will probably want to ask. Um, there was strong agreement around subjecting the re, uh, report to a hostile red team analysis by machine learning because this will be done for you even if you don't do it. So essentially recognize that this is going to be done for you whether you like it or not. I, I recommended having the uh, asking machine learning to analyze this in the style of Steve Coonan. <laughs> to whom I've been subjected, um, and, this, and see how that goes. Stephen, my voice is probably going to act as the natural break of my input here. <laughs> um, Julie, could you take over? Thank you. You'll need your microphone. Um, yeah, so I think that the uh, the documenting piece is really important. Um, and then I think uh, maybe a little where we're going in terms of the information to deliver to the authors now. And this kind of speaks to also what, um, uh, Ariel, the question you, know, you raised at the beginning and thinking about specific goal of, you know, a goal of NCA6 in terms of that integration um, and how to deal with a diverse array of sources of knowledge and information um, that how um, understanding, um, and I forget who said this, but I think you had mentioned it, um, Emily, of I love that articulation of AI will not be the first step, last step, or the only step in the process. Um, thinking also through the lens of, um, and I think Jane, you spoke to this, uh, or, and Phil is like AI as the reviewer. Um, too, and thinking about that review process. So how do you view AI almost through that lens and thinking about in that reviewer context? Um, and then, you know, in terms of uh, not necessarily an approach, but, um, you know, there's been so many guidelines developed already in the context of AI. So looking to, for example, the health community guidelines that they've developed, um, conversations with it came up yesterday, connections with the state assessments. Um, so what are they thinking about? You know, what are their leads thinking about in, in this context in their offices? Um, you know, there's been, um, you know, indigenous groups that have put forward guidelines on use of AI and research and, you know, especially climate related. And so, you know, looking to some of these, so we're also not developing, you know, reinventing the wheel here. Um, and I think that is most of the top things. Others in the group, if we missed anything. Sorry, I don't. I don't know whether. It, but we talked a lot about things you can do now for this assessment, and then kind of a bigger program aiming towards the next one. So, I think you hit all the points, but it might be helpful to break them down into. Were there th were there some things from the what we can do now that you want to put into the room now for our later discussion? What were some things? What were the op some big opportunities that you heard? for what we can do now. Well, I, I think we talked a bit about experimenting with ways to use AI and finding out how it may impact outcomes that authors might be using or that the TSU might be using and also kind of stress t testing or red, red teaming early drafts as they're coming out, you know, what's coming out of that or even trying it on the last NCA, seeing what it 
produces with different tools and, and just getting insight to how, you know, and, and maybe early warnings for things like consistency across chapters to the authors. So it, it might not be the outcome you use so much, but it might be a tool. But the longer term ones is I think was more kind of systematic thinking about what you would want to know for the next assessment to be able to improve the guidelines and, and get more systematic evidence that you could use to justify the decisions that you make. I mean, you've got to do that in both stages, but they'd be presumably different. And, and then actually just, just one other point we um, that a number of folks kind of made in different ways in the group speaks to um, kind of the use of AI to benefit a specific kind of human draining type of task, like Fred sitting there clicking <laughs> through, through every citation, um, as opposed to generating information, right? And so that's an example of maybe there's specific guidance, you can use it, you know, um, for that type of task, but you're not going to use it to maybe generate new information. Um, so I'll start out for the uh, virtual group and then invite folks to join in. I'm going to um, raise to the very front um, a, a issue that was um, raised near the end of our talk, which was um, the importance early on of understanding all of the different agencies' approaches to AI. Um, since agencies have to sign off on the National Climate Assessment, we certainly don't want to set something up where an agency is then unable to sign off on a final sign, uh, assessment because their, their policies around use of AI differ from what was used in the NCA. Um, so, um, sort of early foundational question. Um, then um, our group had some interesting conversations about the difference between in the early stages, AI as a partner on chapters that already exist and are being updated versus the couple of chapters that are new. So there is a new, I mean, there's rural, rural content from the prior NCA, but it's a new chapter. So is there, there might be opportunities in thinking through the content and the scope of new chapters in a way that's different from um, from up from teams that are updating or carrying forward long longer standing chapters, um, and um, there are noted some opportunities of existing tools around. Um, AI related tools with fuzzy match that help understand, for instance, differences between what has been said and what is the, you know, what is, if you're looking at the literature that was used in NCA 5 and comparing it to the literature base that people are pulling together for the NCA 6 chapters, that may help identify what's new versus what's, what's old um, in topics and also literature from one assessment to the next. Um, the um, uh, graphics generation, there was the uh, notion of, um, again, the AI as a creative partner, um, that there may be real opportunities. And I think you, Ariella, opened that this is an option of um, teams that an AI may be able to generate a larger number of just initial thinking um, about what figures might look like um, that could be creative input to um, to the work of the team. Um, the um, another tool that was discussed in our existing tool or uh, mechanism AI related mechanism that was discussed um, at length in our group was around evidence mapping um, and really being able to under helping to understand gaps or evolution. So um, there may be opportunities within uh, using AI evidence mapping tools to look at how the first, the zero order draft and the second year zero order, second order draft, how teams are evolving and maybe also use that to identify some gaps that still remain. Again, with the caveat that that's drawing on the literature that the AI tool has at its in its database. So that's not identifying the gaps that are in its underlying tool. Um, reference some of the things that have been talked about, about reference checking and cross-referencing consistency across the report, um, both in the text and the literature. Um, and um, there was a brief discussion about 
the the one of the big challenges in the report is is word counts and the limits on word counts and 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 staying within that and wondering whether there's some way of AI either helping with uh, streamlining language or clarifying language that can help the authors with some of their wanting to get more in and how they say that in a way that is um, that fits within all of those uh, requirements. Um, and then on the report writing um, there, this was referenced earlier, but sort of preemptive uses of AI. People are going to develop a chatbot out of NCA6. Um, and so the question is, is, are there ways of using it preemptively to see what kind of issues might come up? You never know what the tool is, so you don't know what those specific problems are, but, um, but also what, um, is there a way of partnering with a, a tool developer to do that? So it's not necessarily a federal product, not necessarily his stamped as official, but where you're actually having conversations with a tool developer who is using that and talking about important things like, can you build into your tool that you're always bringing up the confidence level for any statements that are returned and returning full paragraphs and just trying to develop some of those guidance to tool developers so that tools that are going to be developed are better supportive of conveying the nuance and the and the depth of the NCA. Um, and um, also, you know, to the red teaming is people are going to use it to try to find gaps and holes and inconsistencies inconsistencies in the in the in the report it's going to happen how do we think about how we use those to to think about what might be coming up in advance um and then on the um some of the what we might be asking to the um, to the AI developers, one was um, given the transparency um, principle that's really important. Um, uh, one request or requirement is we may need to use open source tools so that those databases are um, something that can be vetted. And those tools are coming available, but can set some of those principles saying, for us to be able to use it, we need this kind of transparency in our tools. Um, additionally, um, uh, tools that enable some of the things that we were just talking about of picking paragraphs from the current from a draft, um, and how are we? How do you look for inconsistencies across a report? What is our what are tools that can enable that, um, as well as fuzzy match ML tools? Um, that um, are helping us understand differences, whether it's between um, one version of the report or another, or one NCA or another, and to understand those evolutions and differences um, that might help us focus on where we need to pay attention to. Are we comfortable with those differences and what's being left out? Um, anything else from the virtual group? Robert. Yeah, um, one more idea that I found exciting and that came out of the group and not particular from any one person is that we can think about the application of AI when the report is released beyond the response, which is essentially to embedding a his, his, his hostility, which is to look for mistakes and embarrassments and so forth, that there will be value added applications of AI to the report more likely than not, uh, that will make it more use. It have it'll have a wider set of functions post release than NCA five because AI is in existence that can create the matches, and that for the writers of the NCA six, therefore, this is somewhat conjectural, but not too much. Uh, there would be an interest in creating the handholds so that um, that these AI post release applications. Uh, can be more easily developed. And there's a, a sense that it's going to be a bigger deal because AI can add value to the report when it's out. Somewhat amorphous, but it's it sounded right to me. I'm curious what others think. 
Yeah, and that was in the context of a, a potential hybrid tool that in, embeds both the, uh, the the report itself and the literature, so enabling people to, to dive into some of, the, some of the underlying literature as well as the the sent consensus um, messages that are in the report itself. Um, other thoughts or comments here? We. Um, just to to look ahead, we're um, we're almost at at noon Eastern time, um, so we'll be breaking for lunch in just a couple of minutes. And um, this was really all intended to be some food for thought for um, a discussion that we have in an hour. And and when we come back, um, I will will um, open that discussion. And I I encourage people to think specifically about the request that Ariella made, which was what are things that can be done now in this process, both to whether they're informing NCA 6 or setting the groundwork so that uh, NCA 7 at this point in the process are much further along. Um, any other comments? Um, Caitlin, can you pull up the, oh, raised hand. I... Chaoxing. Uh, uh, yes, in our virtual group discussion, I think I brought a point, and uh, um, <clears throat> um, we probably should be encourage uh, developers of the AI tools or AI systems and models, um, not just the language, large language uh, model we are talking about here, using uh, chat GP or so whatever, and for for the language uh, part, and I uh, um. One important thing I brought up was uh, uh, this is a scientific uh, assessment, uh, science-based and also data-driven. And we have not touched, uh, discussed a lot of those uh, um, 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 AI tools for, for the data work. Um, it seems uh, missing uh, in this uh, discussion, this uh, meeting. Um, so probably it's too much, but uh, um, it's something to think about uh, uh, down the line because the IPCC is doing doing so. I'm a co-manager of the IPCC Data Distribution Center, so we're we're trying to do this um, in the AR7 cycle. Thanks. Um, with that, Caitlin, will you bring up that slide? Um, so one of the things that um, USGCRP asked us. Uh, to do in this meeting um, is to come together, um, really try to come to some, not consensus, but um, a sense of the meeting. Um, and um, so we've done some talking amongst the advisory committee um, before today's, before at the beginning of today, um, and we'll be having, after our next hour conversation, um, a, come to a recap. We want to invite you all to join in as well. Um, and so for some uh, crowdsourcing, we have a Slido and we'll leave this slide up during lunch. Um, but we encourage anybody who's in, in, in the virtual or in-person room to um, put the topics that you think or the, the things that you think are the the key things that you have as takeaways from the meeting or things that we want to think about and move forward on coming out of this meeting. Um, and this will all go into that big funnel uh, that uh, Julie is going to help us at the end of the meeting, try to come to a recap of, of what we've been talking about and where we're going next. Um, so that's just inviting you all into the conversation um, as we're thinking about recaps and next steps. Um, so with that, we'll break for the next hour. No, we're breaking. Yes, we're starting back at one. And um, and um, and we will have an hour, one hour um, group conversation about where what we've been talking about for the last day and a half, and try to give some clearer next steps. So thanks. Let's... We have the Slido, and so that we've been getting inputs from there, um, but we're. Um, Phil is now going to lead us in a in a group discussion, really trying to figure out some of those key points and and bring in some of the details from the smaller groups that we want to bring to a larger group. So, Phil. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, I thought our rapporteurs did a good job of uh, summarizing the morning discussions. Um, I'm not going to say a whole lot now, but you know, we we want to have an open time here. Um, this is a great opportunity for USGCRP folks, especially Ariella, to ask us for more clarification or ideas or guidance or anything else uh, based on uh, either what you heard from the morning discussions or what you're what you've thought about on your, your your journey here this morning or what have you not heard that you would like more input on so um, I, I will you know follow the usual convention of watching the uh, hands in zoom um, but I, I also want to reintroduce the the two finger which isn't going to work as well on zoom but if you have a small like one sentence addendum to something someone just said do do the two finger symbol and I'll let you jump the queue and say one sentence if you try to go on I will remind you that it was a two finger and we'll we'll uh, go to the hand so Ariella or Mike I want to give you the first chance to um, speak Hello, Ariella. Mike. I'll defer to please. please. Well, I was going to say, I've been talking a lot. Do you want to say something? I also want to see if, is Phil online? Maybe, you know, it's the not just Phil. the NCA, right? The other Phil. Phil L. Um, but the National Nature Assessment is also bound by this guidance. So I'm curious if Phil has thoughts if he's online. I, I have thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I always have thoughts. Um, I um, I mean, I think we're in a really different phase. Maybe I should turn on my video. I didn't plan on turning my video, therefore I don't have a collar on, which is uh, violates uh, one of Mike's principles of USGCRP. You're from um, Seattle, Phil. You can get away with that. <laughs> um, I um, I mean, we're in a, a very different place because. Uh, the zero order draft is out in the world right now, and the authors will be beginning to write um, now, uh, trying to get the first draft together by February 11th. Um, and so I think a lot of the information here has been really helpful for me to sort of think through what can the authors do now um, what ideas being discussed could be implemented today, really, in order to help the authors craft a better report. I think particularly around kind of the, the literature reviews um, and really thinking through the vast literature that the authors will have to scour, um, I think I think is going to be helpful. Um, I, I feel like I have a lot to digest though before I take this meeting and turn it into some actionable items for, for the teams. Um, but I do think, for example, um, thinking through, Phil, you you previously mentioned a tool called Elicit, which I've been playing around with um, in Semantic Scholar and some of these other kind of advanced AI based- And that it's built on Semantic Scholar, right? I think that's what we learned yesterday. Oh yeah, yeah, right. Um, I mean, all these tools are, um, I think are gonna be valuable, but I'll, I'll stop there. So if I may very, very briefly, Phil, um, what I've heard over a day and a half is support for our prohibition on the use of generative AI to create text yeah, and support for the careful consideration of exceptions, um, finding places where we can and should uh, encourage and use AI. And that list has expanded um, from what I was thinking. What, and I think what we thought when we developed this, we've heard a lot of good ideas from you all from uh, citation checking to uh, cross chapter consistency checking um, and, and a number of others as the ones that come to mind. So that's what I heard today. And if I, so if I'm missing uh, key points that you, you would want to add to that list, that's what I hope to hear in the next hour and, and a few. Thanks. 
Yeah, I mean, I'll add the other thing that we're really trying to do after sort of in post hoc mode, which I think could be useful is to identify some common themes that occur across all chapters. Some of these are pretty obvious, um, like because we designed it that way. And so um, AI is not very helpful to reveal that um, you did what you said you were going to do. Um, but um, there are, I've started to play with it a little bit already to try to see if there are themes that are emerging that are not really apparent um, until you really have, you know, take the, take the effort to dive in deeper. Um, so it's been, it's just, it's been a helpful tool for me to help um, identify those things. And I think as the, the early drafts get fleshed out, there may be some opportunities there as well. Um, <clears throat> so Looking they, for hands. I'm going oh, to see are. something. Um, so well, what Phil said is, an, is important and rings true for me is that, you know, we have to think about all these opportunities and we're not really ready to jump in quite yet, even though we have already jumped in, right? Like we did write a policy. We did call you all here. We did formulate this conversation, um, but it it's created a bigger space than I think we might have anticipated for the possible uses. Um, so I, I have learned that there's these different kinds of AI uses. So there's the production of the of the assessment and thinking about ways that we can make things easier and more time, you know, cautious or or conservative. Um, ways that we can improve the NCA for editing. So making sure there's consistencies across the report. But then there's also these uses of AI for um, for improving the NCA and its uses. So finding commonalities, identifying themes, and then and then what do we do with those things? I think is the next question. And so it's not obvious to me that each of these activities lead to the end of the NCA, but that they're part of sort of a spectrum of activities. And you know what we do with maybe a tool that helps us identify themes is still TBD. You know, so we identify the themes. Then what? So you know, there's there's a, a lot of then what's to me that are on the table, and I'm happy that we had this conversation over the last couple of days because I don't know that my mind was going to all these spaces, you know, it's really expanded. Um, but the one thing that's clear to me is that we really have to think about the guide rails. And I would love more education on guide rails. How do you train an AI to tell you what you want to tell you? How do you make sure that you ask it in the correct way to get what you want? How do you fix that <laughs> on the other side? How do you check the training data and the biases? Like all of this stuff that we heard yesterday, I don't know how to do. I am not sure that every author knows how to do. I'm sure there are some, but there are 400 of them. I don't know. So those are sort of the things that I'm most eager to get very direct advice on or, or consultation so that we can make sure we're creating guardrails that will help all of the authors do a better job, but not confuse them or create more problems down the line. So that's sort of where I am with specific questions and sort of more theoretical spaces. Okay, okay, Karen, and then Ben. So what did you think of the uh, discussion yesterday when we talked about training and, you know, for the authors? What, what did you, what do you think about that idea? Or is, there, is that problematic? It's not problematic. And in fact, um, our staff is already preparing some training. In the background, you know, we have been working on this. I think the question is what is in that training as is most relevant to the things that we heard yesterday. And so um, some side conversations I was having with my staff who are thinking about this really deeply is they were saying, you know, we're looking at the NIST work and we're looking at this work and this is how we're being informed. And then I think as we think through how we might tell authors how it might apply, we will need to shift. Maybe NIST doesn't deal with the same questions that we're dealing with. So we'll have to reapply the questions in the right way to think through some of the things that came up yesterday in terms of how we would do a literature search for, a literature search for climate in the assessment that goes along with other kinds of information. And I think that's a different question than the other agencies are thinking of. And so um, thinking about training what we've already done, but maybe shifting it a little bit to address the questions at hand. So yes, good training, excellent. All about it. Ben. 
Yeah, uh, uh, apologies if I'm just repeating other ideas I missed out on earlier discussions this morning, but, um, you know, it's, it seems like what we're about to engage in is this sort of big natural experiment on, you know, the use of, of AI as one conducts a, a national assessment. And therefore, one of the most important things that we might be able to do is just sort of capture what we're learning along the way. So for example, one of the things the NCA does is bring a lot of smart people together to do assessment work. A lot of those folks are probably already experimenting on their own with uh, the use of some of these tools in very simple ways. And some might have some pretty elegant ways of using these that we don't even know about yet, right? And so thinking about um, they're trying to anticipate all of that just trying to capture along the way and sort of regular check-ins with author teams, like how are you using this technology? What are you using it to do? What tools or platforms are you using to do it? And then that gives you sort of a body of data that you can circle back on later and say, um, you know, sort of what did we learn from this whole process? What worked well, what didn't work well? You can take all of your notes and put them into a generative AI and it'll tell you at the end of the assessment, like, Here's what we learned. Um, and, and that might be at the end of the day, like where the real value lies rather than in trying from the outset to set a lot of boundaries and guardrails and anticipate every possible use. Over. I have a two finger on that. And that is maybe you can generate out of these 400 smart authors, maybe you can encourage them to form their own learning community and be a little more self-propelled than just, you know, um, Sarah and then Jane. Yeah, I, I, I oops. Do this. Um, uh, I wanted to finger that as well. It was one of the key themes of our conversation was around uh, uh, imagining a, a meta scientific end endeavor that uh, is undertaken throughout for all aspects of the report production. Um, and and collecting data along the way so providing guidance so which in turn encourages transparency about when ai is being used how well it worked you know something relatively simple for everybody to sort of track um, uh, the other thing um, i wanted to just suggest on um, you know the possibility of working with ai tool developers <laughs> To help you on a variety of things and one of the things that i was thinking about is uh and osvaldo and i were talking about this to and leslie ann we're talking about uh sampling the data and the, i mean the literature and the evidence and using network sampling theory to um, imagine how you would not only find find corpuses but find related corpuses but in a much more directed way by the user so thinking of tools that could be helpful like if you're seeding a bunch of literature across a number of disciplines and it's hard to use a you know an existing tool that may only have one corpus of literature that it's engaging with but if you could use a variety of different seeds to network sample subsequent citations you could actually generate a body a picture of the literature that doesn't involve reading thousands and thousands of articles and doing it on your own. So just to, but th that's just one example of a possible tool that could be developed and uh, in collaboration with a tool developer partner. Stephen has a two finger on that and then we'll go to Jane. I just want to connect it to, um, to the presentation that uh, I gave yesterday of the evaluation to your talk about uh, using network analysis within the literature. Um, there is a real focus in that um, strategy for evaluation for leveraging network network tools to identify and connect with use the users of the NCA. So there's sounds like there's a potential for some co-learning on that front. Thank you. So um, with regard to well we you've heard things about you know doing early assessment or reviews of the drafts with ai to find out what you're revealing but what to do with it and i think one of the primary uses of it is just to inform the the lead authors and and say this theme has appeared here 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 and here 
and we see inconsistent or we see inconsistencies in the uses of these terms and then saying, please go back and resolve them. And the earlier in the process you could do that, the less likely you're gonna go down, they're gonna go down the road wordsmithing things ignorant of what's happening in other parts of the report. And so, you know, as I think we said over and over again in our in our group, it's they're tools, but they're but they're insufficient in themselves. They're just things that can help. And and in one of those regards, it seems like AI has an ability to see much more broadly than your average human eye. And and so while we all are gonna have limits to how much we can absorb, it's going to be able to do that, but that doesn't mean it does it perfectly. It needs to be supplemented with other sources of literature, maybe using other tools or, but it, at least it's a, it's kind of an early warning system of, of issues that might come up later. That's a good point. Susan? Yeah, thanks. I want to um, go to what Ben was um, saying. My first reaction was, um, well, he was making the point that you could um, let people sort of experiment with and do with AI what they uh, might do and then learn from that. And my first and it, and, um, reaction was, I'm not sure the NCAA has that luxury of um, being a testing ground. But then I wondered if there's a hybrid approach where you could, um, in addition to having an AI person with responsibility for that as part of the technical support team, maybe appoint one person per chapter author group to be an, I don't want to use the term AI representative because that's a scary thought, but um, you know, to be kind of the point person for AI on that chapter and then they're coordinating that way you don't have to necessarily get every author kind of on the same page with um, what they can and can't do, but there's a human providing oversight on each chapter. Like that idea, uh, Kathy. Yeah, I guess I'm following in what Susan and Ben said. I keep thinking about these 400 authors, um, particularly from re regional chapters, and I think the learning curve is going to be really steep for some of those authors, especially as um, NCA is trying to bring in new voices and voices from underrepresented groups, and. And so there have to be some really clear guidelines and also expectations about how AI is going to be used by these authors, or it's going to be really hard to, to recruit them, I think. Um, and so maybe having someone on each author team who could, could kind of guide that um, and help people understand the exploratory um, aspects of AI for bringing in information. I personally think the best uses are sort of behind the scenes in the production of the NCA, all the things we've talked about of providing consistency, improving the glossary, um, looking for um, that sort of thing. I mean, that seems like stuff that could be done, but I think it's going to be a burden on a lot of, on some of the authors. Bill and Jane, is yours still up or is it stale? Okay. Bill. This is on the same point. I was going to ask, uh, do you have the concept of uh, chapter scientists? Um, this was a thing during the most recent IPCC assessment. So uh, each of the chapters, and at least working group one, I think all the working groups had someone who was essentially a dedicated, uh, you know, knowledgeable PhD scientist, but was acting really to herd cats on the chapter and did a lot of the, the, uh, the handshaking with the TSU. But that, if there were an analog uh, for the uh, National Climate Assessment, it seems like the chapter scientists might be a, a very logical sort of point uh, to your point, Susan, about having somebody who's uh, on, on deck for this issue, that might be the logical person. Um, we don't have something like that. Uh, we, as, we rely on the idea that all of our authors are experts, scientific experts in one way or another. Um, but I, I do want to address the sort of idea of changing the author teams. Like that, we're late for that. <laughs> like the guidance is out and they're being, they're being recruited. And without having that direction ahead of time, it's very hard to retrofit a team with someone who's suddenly going to be AI competent 
um, in the way that we're asking. And I would not expect every team to have that, or I, I wouldn't not, not even retrospectively, I wouldn't ask them. That's not why they joined the team. So, um, you know, I, I just also want to say, we're trying to come up with a policy for how to use AI. We are not saying use AI, you know, and those are two different things. And so the, I feel like in these conversations, we might assume that every team will use AI, but I don't know that every team is going to use AI. And and so that's why the, guard, the guardrails are there. So if they choose to, they're doing it consistently, but it doesn't have to be done for every team because every team is doing something different. And so what our job is to do is make sure that chapters are created in a way that speak to each other, but how that comes to be is not necessarily, you know, something that we require in a particular way. And so um, I just wanted to say that again, to reiterate that, that we can't retrofit, but we can try to ease the pain down the line um, going forward. Thank you, Susan. I. I interpreted Susan's suggestion as sort of ask for a volunteer for someone who's willing to try to track these issues on behalf of the chapter, not, you know, so the question might be, are you enough of an early adopter that you have ever used chat GPT? And that might be the bar you set. And if someone is willing to spend two hours, you know, reading Allah's paper and looking at examples and talking with the other volunteers from, sorry, this is more than a two finger, um, that might get you where you want to go. And, and so it's not changing how you pick authors. Um, Bill, is that a stale hand or? Okay, Sarah. Oh, Sarah sorry, F. yes, <laughs> it's me. Sarah F um, has her hand up, Sarah, R, Sarah C doesn't. Yes. Um, well, one of the things that um, came up in discussion was a little bit about. Oh, it's okay. Uh, was a little was a little a little bit about how the the broader dissemination of the NCA is really informative to the climate services work ahead, and how people um, we know that people are already using the NCA um, to make derivative products that help support climate services and um, you know what is the role for the USGCRP in like providing guidelines or support or things that could help with those derivative products we know you know, may not want to be in that space <laughs> of like actually in the what what the use space is but that there could be some fruitful linkages there to explore Karen yeah because actually this is something that was brought up in our uh, small discussion, because what I'm hearing you say is people don't have to use AI, but if they do, you want to have guard rails. But I, there was there was a comment, I don't know if it was Bill or somebody in my group, that was making a comment that AI may, actually may be beneficial, and you may want to encourage it, um, maybe not for this AR, you know, maybe for AR7. Could you, in this AR, though, it, it kind of makes a nice natural experiment to say, okay, did the chapters that used a lot of AI were they better? I don't know. There's a you know how do you evaluate that? I'm not sure. Than the ones that use less AI, and so having a point of contact or somebody in each chapter who could at least keep track of how AI was used in their chapter, you might be able to evaluate whether AI actually improved the chapters. And then going forward with the next AR, you might want to encourage the use of AI. So you using this as a, as a natural experiment. I don't know what your thoughts are. It could be. I mean, I would think we would have to think about what those experiments might be. It might be. I, first of all, don't know what better might mean. I don't know how you compare across chapters. One thing we talked about in our small group is maybe the physical science chapter, foundational physical science is completely AI driven. The social systems chapter is not going to be that because the literature is not in the AI model. You know, it's not in the, the database. So what's better? I, I don't know. So it, in some ways it's about comparing it to itself in this field in this way of describing the issue, did it do better than the other way? But I don't know how to do that. Yeah, but what if you what if you compared yeah. AR5, NC, yeah. or sorry, it's NC, yeah. So the, 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 the five with the six. Again, I don't know what better is, was NCA5. I, I, I think you could say, thought, I, thought. we did have a conversation about what if we picked a part of NCA5, ran it through, 
we tried to do the same, produce the same thing with AI. What would it look like? Would it be different in the outcomes? Would it have more data? Would it give out different, you know, different values, different key messages? And then we can say, well, are they better? Are they worse? You know, that we can compare five to a, a theoretical five. But I think going from six to five is is different because the literature is different, the input from the public is different, the authors are different. I mean, that is the nature of an assessment is that it's reflective of the moment. And so it's not necessarily comparative to the one before it, um, which is why we change the table of contents and we do all, we change author guidance. So it's not, the rules aren't even the same. But to your point, yes, there is experiment that we could do. We can think about how to do to see if it's different and then decide what better means yeah, down yeah, the road. Yeah, absolutely. Two finger to Jane, and then we'll go to Allah. Oh, Miriam also has a two finger. I would think that you might be able to come up with a set of metrics, which wouldn't be perfect metrics, and they wouldn't be complete metrics, but some things where you could measure, even if it's the sense of the convening lead author or of reviewers, are there fewer problems with consistency in the draft that goes to the government reviewers than there were last time around. You know, it they may not be very precise, but it still gives you a sense of, and you might not know that it was exactly AI that was doing that, but there are things that you might think of as being issues that the NCA always copes with, um, or usually copes with, and that AI might serve and kind of just ask that question. Mir Miriam, two finger. Sure, I mean, yeah, it's um, it's the same point, right? There, I think if it, there must be some objectives for these reports that are being met or not, and there should be some way of comparing whether they're improving or not and whether they're increasing usability. I mean, any sort of goals that the, the reports have should be, um, able to be evaluated, measured, and I do, yeah. So I, I agree with the point that seeing if AI improves whatever goals that the reports have is, does not sound like uh, impossible task to me, especially if these reports are going to be done in like the span of five years, right? Which again, um, I, at, at some point, I think it's going to be very difficult to not um, use <laughs> AI, um, especially as it's changing so much. So thinking about that time frame also is important. Allah. Thank you. Um, I'm just thinking out loud here, just listening to everyone. I think there are two modes of operation, if I may put it this way. There are central use cases, such as cross-checking across chapters, across reports. And this sits solely with the TSU, for instance. And there are chapter-based use cases and this is, gives rise to the question, do we involve chapter scientists? Do we involve um, someone from the authors? Um, one, one example we tried to do in AR6 in the IPCC is to archive the data for all uh, the figures of all chapters. But we failed to do that because we came up with the idea about a year into the assessment cycle. Um, so we dimmed down the ambition to specific figures only in the SPM. But what we're planning to do in AR7 is what we call data stewards. So each chapter, there's a data stewards, especially the data heavy chapters that take care of this kind of activity. So we could think of AI and data science stewards that sits within the chapter. And I appreciate it's difficult to change the structure now. Um, but my worry is the moment we start mentioning um, chapter-based use cases to authors, this might, uh, you know, discourage some of them from involving because we yet adding more, uh, more tools that they need to get up, up to speed to to do the assessment. Um, so this this is something uh, to keep in mind. Um, the also one more idea: the uh, UNEP geo assessment. ChatGPT came um, into about year two of that assessment. And suddenly now the secretariat is scrambling, trying to get everyone to sign a form that they will not use chatbot to generate their assessment. Um, so unfortunately, we, we, we're trying to catch up with all of these things. But um, I, I guess what I'm trying to say, the more we plan ahead, the better. Um, and 
my final thought is that if, if we perhaps start to kind of categorize what are the central use cases and make sure that these are kind of um, whether whether or not we want to do them, and then the chapter based use cases, I, and then if we are to apply a chapter based use cases, then I would suggest that we apply them to all chapters. Otherwise, we might end up with an assessment where we have a two-speed chapter or multi-speed chapters, a chapter that was able to scout the entire literature because they used some machine learning tools and chapter that relied on old-fashioned approaches. And then suddenly, you have a multi-speed um, uh, chapters in the same assessment. And that, that, that might not be very good for the final outcome. Ariel, any? reaction or shall we go to the next question just want to give you a chance. Oh, it's all interesting and we'll we're going to think about many of those issues yeah thanks julie um yeah just sharing a few thoughts that have emerged and, and i appreciate what all just said and thinking about that uh you know how do you consider even like what is data heavy chapters because even what's considered data right <laughs> in different contexts and i don't argue it's all data heavy um mm -hmm. but you know in terms of the use kind of by whom and and how and for what purpose Something we that we talked about in our um, morning session was also just um, you know it's come up a few times about you know the erasure of of certain um, sets of information like social science literature not coming up, but also um, you know I'd share in there's a case study that's been a community case studies but it's been used in the last three NCAs. That, and also physical scientists have used parts of it as examples in their chapters. So it's come up even more in the physical heavy chapters. And when I've experimented putting that into a few different AI tools, um, what comes up is one very heavily told story by the state and the state scientists. Um, and so you are going to get a very skewed perspective if we're trying to reach objectivity. Um, so it's kind of a warning call. And in terms of even, it's come up a couple of times how to maybe think about this in the context of even generating key messages. Um, so for a, a prior chapter I'd worked on when we, when we were deciding on the key messages and the key themes, one of the key themes that we actually Actually went with in the literature, um, but through dialogues and conversations that all of us, a widespread group, had had across regions and multitudes, we knew from that if we were brought in in that expertise to know, okay, this is what is at the foremost for what communities are working on. There's very strategic and political reasons that they weren't having that put into literature, but wanting information on it. And so that's the type of information, right, that you're not going to be able to generate. Um, and that's where I say a little bit maybe of, of how we think about the, the human intelligence here. And then just as add on to that, you know, something that hasn't come up as much, I put this in the notes, but, you know, for doing this under the, in the context of working on a climate assessment and thinking about places where, you know, contrarians are going to ping like it hasn't really come up kind of the considerations of energy use for operating AI and how that's reconciled in the context of using it for a climate assessment and I just feel like that's a really big elephant kind of in, in these spaces um, I have no solution to that I just putting it out there Osvaldo I want to say a few words about consistency uh, I think I support the idea of being consistent in terms of very basic things, definitions and units, while I encourage us to don't the opposite, to maintain diversity of scientific approaches and different nomenclatures that there are different uh, groups of scientists. So consistency is not always a good thing. You, you don't want to force everybody in a single channel that will, I think, alienate part of the community or, um, on the other hand, uh, may lead us into errors. And just a very simple example, the um, atmospheric community has uh, for flows of CO2 has one convention, what is positive and when, and the ecological community has the opposite convention. And you, you, 
if you say, oh, everybody assumes that if, if the flow of carbon from the atmosphere is then the, the ecosystem is a, is a sink, that's positive or it's negative. You, I suggest that we highlight that there are differences in which there is no consistency, but allow that diversity to flourish or stay. End of comment. Bill. At the risk of saying something kind of controversial, I'm um, after listening to this conversation, I'm increasingly nervous about dispersing machine learning out to the chapters uh, because you know the the people leading this project are nervous about it and don't have you know yet formulated existing guidance about how to do this. It's rather critical that all the chapters be operating according to roughly the same operating system. We're not sure what that looks like at the moment, um, so that argues a little bit more for experimentation with machine learning within the TSU, where it can be centralized, localized, um, and you know can be applied where, in a way that is consistent because it's operate it's within a single unit of the of the report, but not dispersed in a way where, you know, both sides of that transaction, both you and the chapter authors, are trying to figure out what to do. That to me does not compute uh, in the context of an assessment. So, sorry to be controversial, but. Um, yeah, I, I empathize. We invite that whole range of, of <laughs> this is not intended to be something where we're pushing AI or, or discouraging. And so thanks for that. Well, and actually my comment maybe is offering another hybrid possibility here. Um, you know, I started thinking if the underlying literature uses AI, I don't think the chapters would necessarily exclude that literature because it uses AI. And then I thought, well, the chapter could publish uh, the results of using AI um, as long as it's published by the publication cutoff for inclusion in the NCA, then that could get included, right? I mean, so maybe one approach would be to tell chapter authors if you're gonna use AI, submit it for publication and have it peer reviewed before using the NCA. Ariella, I'm imagining if I were in your shoes, this might feel a little overwhelming. Uh, you know, you should do this, you should design a, th and I, I think, you know, we're a, we're a community of thought partners with you and you have a lot more thought partners you know, walking this journey with you and, you know, back to the suggestion of sort of an AI lead in each chapter. However, you know, I think if you look for volunteers to do some of these things, you know, head up a, a you know, a task force to do X or run a training on this tool or, or this approach or whatever, um, I, I think you'll find that it need not all rest on your shoulders and those of, of, of the, the TSU and, and USGCRP. So... Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I'm also not overwhelmed. I think I'm excited. Um, and I'm I'm also, you know, there's a lot to think about. And so I, my goal, and I think the goal of the whole GCRP is to publish the best, the best NCA we can. And so all of this information and all of this thought partnering is key to making sure that we do that. So I appreciate the offer and the conversation and, you know, the diversity of views. Thank you, Bill, for your caution. <laughs> um, you know, and, and just thinking through the issues with us. So not overwhelmed, looking forward. Um, when we stepped into this meeting and the planning for it, we really took the request that you all gave us seriously, which was about the assessment process. And um, we have people around the table who are very involved in the in the scientific discovery side, which includes AI and have been very good about holding those comments, but I think we're in a different place now than as we started to talk about NCA 7. When NCA 7 comes, the literature that you're going to be looking at is going to have a lot more AI-generated, AI-assisted content. And so I think thinking with some of those partners, such as the people in the in the magazines or the journals that we, um, that we talk to about how you're thinking about the literature that's coming in and the AI influence as we're already start thinking about NCA7, I think that's gonna be a much bigger question than, um, than it is currently. I see no other hands, but I invite, we still have a little bit of time. Oh, there's Julie V, okay. 
Yeah, well, to play off that last comment, um, I think as part of the committee thinking about global change and AI is something that um, uh, is going to be kind of a natural thing that we think about going forward, but kind of in between the space of of all of what's possible in the global change space and the assessment process, specifically what we've been talking about, I feel that there's some really close near neighbors of how is it that the discussions today can help to inform other things that you guys are taking on within the USGCRP. And I mean, there actually might be some places to pilot some of these things as well that like they, they may not fall under the scientific assessment, but within government agencies, how are they using and navigating that as well? So I just kind of would welcome kind of thinking a little bit more broadly of what what this conversation means to um, the bigger realm of where you all are thinking within the USGCRP. Um, I, in a minute, I'll give Mike a chance to respond if he wants, but I see Ben and then Rob. Yeah, I mean, I think if we take the, the notion, I mean, I guess people's concerns about this arise from the credibility issue. And so if we take, you know, maintain the credibility of the National Climate Assessment is a non-negotiable issue, then what guardrails can we put in place to, to, to support that? And there might be like simple things like, yeah, you can't use generative AI to write your chapter. Um, but the, I mean, one other, in, in addition to that is also like transparency is really important from a credibility standpoint. And therefore you can, I can envision um, you know, in reporting out in the assessment, it's like these are these are what authors are not permitted to do with AI. Um, but they were permitted to do other things. And here are like statements of like for every chapter, there's an addendum, which is like this is how AI tools were used for in this particular chapter. And then for your articulating what you're using, what you used it for, you know. Maybe you do that at the PSU level as opposed to the chapter level, um, but at least that way you're being transparent about what it is you're you're trying to do. And there's a there's a account of, of how the technology was used. Sorry for the barking dog. No apology needed, Rob. Yeah, I'm gonna. One thing I've learned here is to me quite exciting, and that is that. NCA 6 will be less intimidating than any previous NCA or any previous um, assessment report from the IPCC because they are all examples of very big data that, that AI is in the process of taming. Um, and so questions of, of finding something out that is in a NCA 6 will be quite different. Um, and, and students can use it and, and others and the index will have been replaced by something far more, far more flexible, and which interrogates the report uh, with follow-ups and so forth. Um, and then the question for the developers to, is to help the process so that the final product is as matched to what AI can do to it after the fact as possible. I started this meeting and then heard lots of others speak about the the um, the AI being a, a a weakness of the a potential weakness of the report, a point of it of attack for those who, who want to attack it. But I think it's got a very different positive side to it in the in the aftermath, which is what we spent quite a bit of time talking about. We spent much of our time about how you prepare the report, but I think there's this other element of how it will be used uh, that is a, actually a quite exciting story. Thank you. Two finger to Jane. I, I'm glad you raised that, Robert. And um, so we've talked a little bit about getting feedback from the the authors about how they're using AI and if they're experimenting with it, with it, and what their experience is. But I, I mean, this is maybe way out there and things you can't do. But given that it's 
unlikely that users of the NCA won't be using tools like chat, like chat GPT to interrogate it. It may be that you want to think towards a user's guide for users about what the experience has been in, for example, prompt design. Or, and, you know, I haven't really thought very far through it, but it, it might head off then if people are, you know, trying to discredit the report by using chat GPT. This is kind of a, more of a side benefit, not the primary benefit, but if they're doing using prompts that are not very good, you know, or changing the temperature of a model to be, you know, less constrained or whatever those things are, but then maybe you can head some of that off by saying the, these are appropriate ways. These are ways in which AI tools might help you interrogate the product. That may be impractical, but. I wanna read a comment in the chat and then turn to Sarah F who has her hand up. Uh, from Aaron, uh, we could scaffold the transparency of how AI tools were used chapter by chapter by building out the traceable accounts and metadata surveys to account for those methods which are already in use for documenting methods. And Sarah gave it a plus one. So Sarah F. Um, I was thinking about how some of the experiments that you might be able to do might not be, you might, there might be other experiments that you would like to do but can't for certain reasons. It would be nice to know experiment ideas that would be useful to learn from outside of the NCA that others could do that would be helpful to you too. Ben, is your hand still up or is that, I mean, is your hand up again or is that stale? No, it's a new one. It's a new one. Oh, new one. All right. <laughs> to you, Ben. No, yeah, it just strikes me that, you know, the IPCC has frequently had observers ride along the IPCC process uh, to study various aspects of it, uh, particularly things like inclusion um, or lack thereof. And so it strikes me that I, I can envision a group uh, that would be really keen to ride along the NCA to sort of study how AI is being used and the, the both the benefits, but also the, the challenges associated with that. We're getting a little bit late, given we got author meeting coming up next month. Um, but if folks could sort of rapidly mm. orient to that, it might be uh, helpful. Over. I had promised Mike a chance to speak. So if you have anything to say, Mike, the floor is yours. Otherwise, we can come back to the room. Yeah, thanks. I, I'll go through a, a unrelated, unorganized list of, of things I've been scribbling down. Um, ben, I think, uh, mentioned the credibility of the product. And I, I wanted to make a, a brief editorial comment because earlier someone said defending the reputation of USGCRP. And I I, I want to make make sure that what we're clear about is it's not the reputation of USGCRP, but the credibility of the product, the authoritative and credibility sense of the product is what's critical to us. And obviously, our reputation is wrapped up in that, but I, it, just an editorial comment. Um, uh, trusting the peer-reviewed literature. There was some comments about, you know, what if there's AI, in, um, artificial intelligence sort of bound up in the literature that we're reviewing. Um, we advocate for and maintain a very strong trust in the the legitimacy of the peer-reviewed literature and the assumption being that the respected journals are putting up the appropriate guidelines and that science is inherently self-correcting so if we if we end up in a in a tangent for some reason um it's it's inherently self-correcting and no one paper is going to come along and and say well that's it we've you know, we've got at it wrong all these years. It's this paper says we're wrong. So a lot of trust in the in the existing peer-reviewed literature and in their adoption of policies and principles around the use of AI. And we heard about that yesterday from, from some of the, the papers themselves. Um, I want to point out some things where we have been, uh, we're never going to be on the cutting edge or the bleeding edge of things, but where I think we're advancing things in a, in a really important, useful way. You've heard a lot of talk in the last few minutes about traceable accounts and the global change information system that underpins them. We think this is something that is is novel to USGCRP and and goes to you know you can say oh yeah you know when we when we come to a key message we say you know we find the following 
you can say, oh yeah. And it's like, you can go, oh yeah. You can see the references that were cited. You can actually see the discussion that the authors had amongst themselves as they not only came to that key message, but but negotiated the language that would be in the key message. So that, that kind of uh, inherent traceability is really important. The NCA Atlas, um, you don't have to just look at the, the graphics that the authors choose to put in the actual report of record, but you can see anything. You can look at the downscaled information in any scenario and any time scale using the NC Atlas, a new, a new um, evolution, and the improved search capability that you find in this assessment. Um, because we have found these things that we talked a lot about, we found emergent topics, uh, the coverage of fish in NCA4. It was stunning to us. There were 50 pages of material across NCA4 on fish. Nobody, had, and we didn't write anything on fish. I mean, we, obviously we did, but there was no intent to do that. It just happened. Um, and so we have an improved search function. So if you want to read about fish in NCA5, there's a much better way of, of doing that. It can help you do that. Um, and so this was the experimental ideas. I, you know, I don't know if any of those things I just mentioned were experimental, but they're certainly cutting edge, I think, um, for how assessments um, use new technology and, and just an example of the fact we, we do do this. Okay, I think that's it for me, thanks. I see Miriam's hand, but just wonder if Ariella or Phil L has a two finger follow-up or or maybe longer than, than that follow-up to Mike's comments. Okay, Miriam, floor is yours. Thank you. And I guess this is uh, following up on Ben and maybe also Mike's uh, point. And I, I, I hadn't, um, it hadn't occurred to me, but in a way we could, if, if there was interest, we could trace the perception of scientists um, as they are producing this report with this incoming AI and, and what their feeling is what they're doing, what they think it is doing to their reports. Is it improving the science? Is it not? Um, so there, there are ways to, you know, like quantitatively, but probably more qualitatively assess how scientists are feeling about the introduction or, or that pressure or potential use or whatever, however it is that they're feeling uh, about this, I mean, I don't want to say new tool, but about this tool, uh, and if they're using it in the report, if they think it's important, I mean, we could uh, do something like that if there would be interest following up on uh, the work that I've done more broadly on just like equity inclusion in the IPCC, in terms of, you know, as the IPCC is trying to become more inclusive, um, we could try something like that, like, you know, with uh, the NCA reports as they're trying to integrate or not AI. So that's something that I, I wanted to follow up on after Ben post, so. Thanks, uh, Phil, and sorry, I didn't give you more than two seconds to raise your hand, but the floor is yours. You know, <clears throat> I, I do have to move the mouse all the way across my screen. So it takes a while. Um, so two things. One is, um, I think, and people can correct, um, NNA2 would be the first USGCRP assessment that would have the opportunity from beginning to end to incorporate all kinds of these AI principles. Um, since NCA6 is out of the blocks already, for example. The, and then I was gonna say the, the so so it's an, so don't forget about the NMA. That's kind of the bottom line there. Um, the thing that I think it would be interesting to do as an experiment really comes down to the bottom line of the assessment, which is what's the key message of a particular chapter messages? What's the confidence and likelihood around those messages? And the experiment I would do is to give the same group of people information, um, two sets of information, one derived without AI, one with AI. Um, and that group of people then would assess that information, however they could do it. And, um, and the, the question is simply, does the key message change? And does our confidence in that key message change? 
that's it. it if I review 10,000 papers versus 1,000 papers and get to the same message with the same confidence, and I haven't really done anything, um, you know. So to me, that is sort of the, the experiment to do. It doesn't seem like it's actually that hard to do. Um, but I don't, also don't think it should be done in, in the context of an assessment, something that could be done separately. That's it for me. Hey, and with that, um, you have not just wasted a perfectly good hour listening to Car Talk. Um, we have covered a lot of ground, and now I think we turn it over to Julie for a recap. Is that right? Julie V. Yes. All right. Well, um, so a pretty big task. I feel like I'm swimming in information and I would confess that there have been times throughout this meeting that I've wanted to take a transcript, um, all of what you've said and use some AI tool to provide me a really nice summary um, so that <laughs> you all have kind of that important information. But I've tried that and they stink. They do a really bad job <laughs> well, of well, really summarizing what's important. <laughs> well, so, but in doing that, I'm now aware of all these challenges. And one of it is where would I go to, to what tool would I use? I, I need training and direction and guidance for, for where would I go to get that? I'm also um, taking the thoughts and ideas of others and sharing them with the world more broadly. Um, and is that appropriate? And would I jeopardize my colleagues' trust in doing that? And then there's also the learning process. And, and maybe this kind of alludes to what Phil just mentioned, like in asking artificial intelligence to synthesize something, not only might you not get the key highlights, but you also kind of miss out on the process of synthesizing and providing highlights that I am learning by doing that too. And hopefully by asking you all to kind of bring forth highlights, you're also doing that. And so that um, the human feedback and building human on human intuition, I think these are all really valuable parts of the process that um, I wouldn't want to lose. And so, so those are kind of some of the things that I've learned. And so I'm not I, I didn't have a chance to, to do that. But so I'm humbly coming to you with my notes and brainstormed list of what colleagues have shared throughout the meeting. And um, this is my recap, but please know I would absolutely love more time and, to synthesize and process, which I also think illustrates one of the key challenges with what we're facing in doing this sort of work. Um, but I, I'm, I'm going to do my best. And then I'm also going to invite the group to give one or two sentences of what their highlights are too. So kind of crowdsourcing that as well. Um, so, so you can be thinking about that as, as I kind of step through what I heard and um, kind of the, the recap. Um, but I, I want it also to be a collective recap. Um, so I heard a lot of questions and this is how my increasing the efficiency or like how can we increase the efficiency um, without kind of adding more work? And it does really feel like this is a lot of work. Yet it's not just about efficiency, it's also about the quality. Um, one of the other questions Robert kept asking, where is it that we are stuck? And what is it that we should do to get unstuck? Um, I also heard Allison Grantham mentioned yesterday, are we focusing on the right incentives? Is further support and focus on increasing publications and the way in which we process data gonna get us where we wanna go? And in some ways to, to what Phil L just presented or, or shared with us, like how are we changing those results? Um, also, what are the risks of leaving AI on the table? Um, and then one of my favorite questions is AI ready for us, which Ariella shared with us at the conclusion of yesterday's meeting. And 
um, one of the uh, questions that Sarah Curran brought up in the in the um, uh, 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 Slido is how can AI help in improving consistency gaps, accessibility, usability, and interactivity? So lots of different questions out there. There's lots to process. Um, but I also heard a lot about attributes of AI that like I hadn't realized. And so I really deepened my understanding about what those are and associated cautions. And so um, thinking through what tools are we considering and for what purpose, which are the classifiers and which are the generative AI? That was something um, we heard from our speakers yesterday. Overall, what is verifiable? Where do things break down? What is repairable? Um, and by whom, who is going to do that repairing? Also, we heard um, AI is really good when there's too much data, but when data is limited, which is often the case um, when there is higher threat, what do we do about that? And so really kind of teasing out when is it most appropriate and where can AI be most effective? But so that there were challenges and cautions, but there's also the opportunity space. And I heard um, a lot about socio-technological knowledge. Um, and so this expertise that is growing. And so looking ahead in five years, we may have a lot, um, a, a group of people that really have the skill set to better navigate this space. I heard the medical field is an early adopter and really somebody to watch and hope that that they can provide some examples and illustrate ways and do some of it, the testing in ways that um, we can learn from them. And then NIST was also a place where I'd, they've been doing a lot of work and so ways to watch. And I'm sure there's a much longer list that we could put together, but that like there's a lot going on in the field and I think it's really exciting. I also heard um, how we're thinking about this within the assessments. So. Uh, the desire being we want the content that comes out uh, to come out of the brain of brains of authors and so how do you do that effectively um heard to what extent is ai introducing new issues um versus maybe just bringing to light some of the issues that we already had and one quick example of that is bias in author selection like maybe ai could help us do that better ai does have bias but we also have bias in our processes anyway. And so to what extent is this new technology making us think through how it is that we operate normally? And, and is that a reason to be scared of it? Is that a reason to embrace it? Um, also, um, Osvaldo mentioned the NCA should be risk avoidant given that AI driven mistakes um, would lead to public opinion to rapidly lose trust and uh, he, he mentioned it in the notes, but also like certainly have heard that time and time again. Um, and also the need to develop evaluation and scientific methods for monitoring and evaluating AI's usage tools at every stage of the process and um, in the production during NCA 6 to help to inform NCA 7 guidance. And so this idea that it's a long process. I also heard really exciting things. Alal, thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, things about harmonizing. So AI tools may assist in translation, particularly in early drafts, and ensure that technical terms are consistent across chapters and with glossary definitions. So some real kind of low hanging fruit that might actually have those efficiencies that, uh, that we're looking for. Um, and then also opportunities for AI teaming like that back and forth and don't depend on AI, but we can use it um, to be more creative, we can use it to get some of those those redundant tasks maybe taken care of more effectively. And importantly, we can learn along the way um, and learn from the authors that are working in this space um, and could maybe develop communities of practice so that we can, whatever we create is more transparent and can work um, to, to just ensure that we keep that trust and make a product that is um, premier and people rely on. Um, and then also the idea of 
ways in which to work with the developers directly. Um, so, I mean, that, that's a smattering of different things that I am going to be taking away with me. But I was also really excited to see kind of this leaning in and wondering, like, what it is that we should do, what it is that we could pilot, and thinking through, like, what, what does that all mean? And thinking about the preparedness that we can be in case there are people using AI to our disadvantage, like, at least we've kind of thought through what, the, what it could look like. Um, and, and really hoping, and we had several breakouts, which I thought were really wonderful ways for us to engage directly. And also um, in this morning, we created some slides and we got to hear from people directly that hopefully provide some of the feedback that USGCRP is looking for in terms of ideas for, for moving forward. So I'm not gonna go into any of those details. You'll get to um, take those documents away and you got to hear really um, um, great um, report backs from the people who presented. Um, so with that, I'd really, I'm going to complete my wrap up. Um, but as I said, I would really love to invite my colleagues to share one takeaway. So one or two sentences, there's a lot of people in this room. Um, and in doing that, I mean, you can look at the Slido, there are definitely some topics on the Slido, but it wasn't the engagement tool that I think we had maybe envisioned it to be. So if you added some things to the Slido, and you're like, that's my one highlight, go for it. And as with the Slido, you don't actually have to have a separate um, highlight, you can point to a highlight that somebody else has already shared to kind of further emphasize that was a highlight um, or, or key takeaway that you're, you're bringing back with you. And so with that, I am going to ask um, Sarah F, would you be willing to share your highlight? And then if people want to kind of raise their hand and and share out, again, we're going to keep this short um, because we, we're a big group and we don't have much time and, and really kind of pressuring you to focus on what, what is that one insight that you would want to share that USGCRP can take back with them in thinking about this in more detail in the future. Yeah, I was thinking the experiment that I'm kind of most excited to see some thinking around is really that human AI team component and how, you know, when you use, you can have this sort of creative thing that happens when you do that pairing. And maybe there's a way to sort of understand like how to use that um, by focusing community of practice energy there. So it's combining ideas, but that really resonated and stood out to me as a, as a fruitful place to to just center some time. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. Anyone else want to highlight there? I'll go ahead and watch the room, Julie, and um, and call okay. from here. That would be great. <laughs> Hi, I'm Beth Sarvin Blankenheim, AAAS fellow. I was going to say AI seems like riding a tiger, but I think it's more like taking an untrained Mustang, getting on, and um, it's thrilling and uh, has potential, but it needs time, training, and uh, to develop that partnership. So that's my takeaway. Thank you. Do we want to go around or do we want to raise hand? And we'll just keep going around and you can pass if you want. I didn't have anything super prepared, but I'd say that I came into this meeting um, being much more on the cautious side, you know, let's just stay away from using AI in the interest of, um, of uh, protecting the credibility. But uh, after this discussion, I've come around to believing that there's a role for AI in many cases, and there's many viable opportunities for human supervision of that as we've discussed. Um, I think one of the things one of my closest mentors and kind of work partners often reminds us is to go slow, to go fast. And I think that's very apropos here and trying to channel him into this space. And, you know, in that context, if we talk about, you know, the importance of um, relationships in this work, I think the question and we, we think about the values and principles and maybe the question for the NCA team and GCRP is what is the relationship that you're prepared to have 
with AI now and moving forward. Um, maybe this is an embellishment of what Julie just said, but it seems to me that the task, the first task you really have is one of setting priorities because it's all kind of overwhelming. And I guess my thought is to try to identify those things that you probably have to do, whether you like it or not. And I would put into that category things like thinking about how um, those who might be critical of the NCA might use AI or your use of AI to undermine the, the credibility of the report. And then the other thing would be just right, something I said earlier, which is to think about a hierarchy among the principles and as you're looking at opportunities for AI to, to think about how it moves, it can move the ball forward on, on the things, on the highest priority principles, you know, which I would say are like transparency or reproducible, that's up to you to decide. But to use that to kind of see how far down your list of things you can go and outsource the rest. I don't have anything to add. I would just two finger everything that Susan, Julie, and Jane have just said. Oswald. I'm I'm a scientist and and therefore I always like experiments. So I really like the idea of experimenting with a, using AI or not using AI. I agree with Phil, there's not necessarily to do it on the assessment. And we can do it with the full set, with the supposedly is AI. We can use it with the one that we, we happen to have in NCA5. We can also use with less than NCA5. What about if we randomly took 50% of the, uh, when is that the outcome changes? And repeat that experiment 100 times. So. We may say, if you don't use AI, you have a probability of not getting the right outcome of 2%. Then it's not worth it to, or not. That's the experiment on me. This is a sampling problem. So I would say we're not starting from scratch and we have a, a really, really robust track record of how to provide guidance and how to think strategically and deeply and broadly all at the same time. So as we're thinking about this and thinking about how to set up those guardrails, we have all of those precedents to sort of build off of and thinking about it in a way that um, allows both the authors but all of the other supporting mechanisms to really um, come to the table and, and benefit and bring their expertise to bear. And I'm thinking particularly about the, the TSU and the richness of the TSU in, in this particular space here and sort of capitalizing on that would be tremendous. And it doesn't, like everybody else said, my plus two um, doesn't have to be all done at once. So there's a, there's a time element in here and there are places where it might be more appropriate further down the line than right now. So giving the time of the time that's needed to actually get there. Yeah, and I, I would just add to that. I mean, I think there are, are some very low risk approaches where you can use this data to improve your product uh, and use AI to do that. And I think that's easy enough to identify. And I would not go slow in those areas. I would go fast in those areas because guess what? Everybody on the outside is gonna go faster. And again, I think your product will be vulnerable to AI users on the outside if you're not ready for that. Uh, it seems to me that you're dealing with the two communities that you're trying to make sure you're serving, both the author team in terms of making sure that they're on board and sort of pointed in one direction. And I will note that the, as we've discovered in this conversation, that there's a lot of controversy around artificial intelligence. And so the harmony of the team needs to be you know, thought of in the context of that this is not an accepted method at the moment. And then, of course, there's the community to whom you're delivering the report. Um, and as... Mike pointed out the the ultimate goal is the fidelity of that report. Some of those those value propositions, the harmony of the author team, its unity, and then the product that you deliver seem to be paramount above everything else. And AM and ML is just a means to an end. Yeah, 
Yeah, I guess I would say, um, and with all respect to the fact of the, of the risk that you guys face and everything, that this is really a great opportunity with the NCA, with the, this current SCA, to gather this information and to try things out. I think if you go too cautiously, you won't be able to gather data, and then you'll you'll have to go the next NCA to learn. So this is kind of a learning by doing opportunity, and so you want to kind of, you know, knowing that you that you're going to face some risks, but I think that's inevitable at some point anyway. So you might as well take the bull by the horns. This is the start of the academic year for a lot of us, and I've spent a lot of time. You know, my job is thinking about what's good for graduate students and. As I've done a lot of orientations over the last couple of weeks, I've tried to emphasize that when you reach the level of a graduate student, which I think is similar to the level of a scientific author or an assessor, um, you are at a level of expertise where your default assumption about any AI tool should be that you are smarter than it. And you need to behave as if you're smarter than it and not defer to it. Um, uh, when ChatGPT came out, a lot of people were using the analogy of a calculator. I think that's a very inapt analogy because what calculators do is perform uh, numerical functions that in a lot of cases we could do by hand with enough time, but those are all about numbers and language is much more human than numbers. And so from the get-go, LLMs seem more human to us, and we are more inclined to trust the the sort of um, messages that they that they give. And so, having that sort of judicious, um, I'm not sure I trust this um, attitude, does not come naturally to us. And so, as we as we think about any large enterprise like uh, the, these uh, USGCRP assessments, I think that's another sort of message about. Um, it's not just about the trustworthiness, but it's about our attitude toward every interaction. Um, last year, uh, last fall, the academies held a really fascinating symposium on the use of AI in research, and a lot of it was very pie in the sky down the road. Um, but there are some amazing things happening already, and and so again, the, the velocity of change is astonishing. And part of what came out of that was. We are not far from the state where an LLM will be able to formulate a scientific hypothesis. And that then becomes a game changer because that, that is the sort of cognitive ability that I think we're, we're dancing around here with an assessment is what is not there. You know, it's easy to react to what you see, but to think about what's not there, what's missing, what are the gaps, uh, what is the cutting edge, um, Humans still are very dominant in that cognitive uh, space, but that too will change. And so maybe by NNA2, we'll be having a very different conversation about the ways that AI can sort of accelerate this, not just accelerate the process, but transform how we think about, you know, incorporating the vast body of scientific literature. Um, the last point I wanted to make was, you know, my, my facetious comment to Julie about summarizing uh, meetings. So, um, I was involved in part of, uh, you know, an effort to sort of assess climate expertise at OSU, and we interviewed interviewed forty five people, and I thought, oh great, we'll have AI transcribe it. It did great at transcribing, but it did terrible at summarizing um, the key points. It did fine saying what they talked about, and I was just thinking, what is missing is that when I come into a meeting, I already have a body of knowledge, and so you might have said one sentence that blew the whole meeting open for me. And that's the thing I'm gonna write down. And the AI is just gonna say, they talked about the US GCRP National Climate Assessment. <laughs> They're gonna miss the context. They're gonna miss that surprise or that um, you know, sense of what's new or different or challenging. Can I jump in? Um, I, mine is just to build really on what Leslie Ann said. Um, in preparing for this meeting, I dove into the appendices of the NCA and spent a lot of time there. And so you should be proud of what's been done over years within the, the NCA. You have a body of knowledge, ways of thinking about things that are very well thought out. Those don't need to be remade for thinking about AI. Um, and so really lean into what you already know and apply it to a new area. 
Well, I guess I'll wrap it up with, I agree with most of what everyone said, um, but I would highlight a couple of things. I think I agree with Aaron and someone else who said, move quickly, don't get the low hanging fruit and move towards it. Don't be afraid for that. And then I think I agree with Osvaldo and Karen, which is that you're, you know, this technology is evolving very, very fast. You have a really nice opportunity to conduct small experiments along the way. Um, I do a lot of program evaluation, and I can't tell you the number of times I'm asked to do a program evaluation where they started with no beginning vision or principles and then carried out a program. You all have principles. You can set up experiments all along the way to see thing, how things work. It's, it's, it's kind of perfect for that. And I would not hesitate to do that at all. So we have too many people in the online to go do the same sort of around the table, but I, I'll open for the next um, couple of minutes, three minutes, um, any hands raised from the virtual who want to um, add your own comments. And then we will um, turn back to USGCRP of some thoughts as, as we close out. So uh, Rob, and then Kathy, and then Miriam, and Kimberly. I've, I've turned from a doubter that it was a, I was all that important to a real enthusiast as I've gone through the last two days. Um, and what I've really appreciated is the is this about about big big data is the critical thing that is being tamed by all of this. This there's been a process underway that has made things too large to be useful. Um, uh, in in both the international and the national prospect, and not that's not true anymore, because this allows you to catch up with the big the big products that are coming out. I'm wondering about the NCAs being coordinated across countries, the NCA being coordinated with UCS US, GCRP, uh, with, with with the sorry with the with the um, international IPCC. Uh, there's the, the the whole the whole thing is going to expand in a way that is simultaneously larger and more useful than before. Thanks, uh, Kathy, and then Miriam. Yeah, gosh, I, I've learned so much over the last two days about AI that I didn't know, and um, I'm gonna love being on this committee. Um, I wanted, maybe because it was one of the first talks, I love David Reed Muller's talk about where AI could fit into uh, the NCA process. I thought he had some really, you know, tangible ideas, some low hanging fruit maybe um, from the scene setting of the NCA, the literature review, all the way to the release, dissemination and, and sort of follow up activities. So that might be the place to look at more closely and think about some of the experiments that Deb and others are talking about um, where AI could be, you know, tried. Thanks, Miriam, and then Kimberly is the last one. Yeah, there, there was so much uh, to digest here, but I, I guess one of the things uh, for me is how, you know, many of the presenters talked about just the, the danger of uncritical use of AI, but there was also a lot of um, hope, I think, you know, it like uncritical use of AI, it magnifies structural inequalities, right? Like whatever is wrong and that is out there, you just use AI as, as, as it is, right? It will be a problem. But I do think that there's like the complete opposite, right? How is AI being used already? And we, we, you know, we had a lot of presenters trying to bring this in, like how can we ameliorate these structural inequalities, right? I mean, people here have already like mentioned, it could even be from like the picking of authors. So I do think there is a lot of opportunity there to, to turn it on its head. That, so thank you. Thanks, uh, Kimberly. Thank you. Um, and I'll just say quickly, I know I'm beaming all over DC. I'm coming to you now for my other office but um but i do want to just um remind you we are you know this is it's been great a couple of days for me and i'm sure everyone's learned a lot but this is 
information from one very limited group of people. So I would just say, you know, kind of think of this as one of, you know, not the only conversation and maybe to take some of what we've been saying to a different audience, maybe audience of AI experts or, you know, to get, you know, maybe more information, especially given that you're working with a very short time frame to try to figure out what you can do and what you should do immediately, you know, just for this, this NCA and then what should you be thinking about already for the next iteration? So I'm, I'm excited about it. Great. Well, thank you Thanks. all. <laughs> um, and as uh, like, we're, 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 we have a minute left of our meeting time and I want to invite Mike or anyone from the USGCRP, if you have um, final thoughts, um, would love to hear them. Julie, let me turn this to my colleagues in the room, please. Thank you, Julie. Um, thank you all so much for the last two days. Um, I and my teammates, um, we feel reassured from our internal conversations. We've been talking about this for the last couple of months and we didn't know, are we worried about the right things? Are we too cautious or are we not reflecting where the rest of the world is? Um, you know, we're not AI experts here. And so we're really appreciative of, of the diversity of thought that you came here. I think it really the many different perspectives that came to the table reflects mm -hmm. the complexity of the NCA and, and the challenge we have ahead of us. Um, thank you to the speakers. I think they were all very helpful in understanding the state of thinking and um, they're very appropriate for, for serving as fodder for this conversation. And thank you to the committee for being attentive to our timeline here and to our resource constraints. And I really do appreciate the focus on the authoritative and traceable principles for the NCA. That's very important to us and I'm glad to see it reflected here in the committee. Um, we loved the small breakout rooms and really like, I really like those one line at the end, you know, summarizing, there was a lot to think about and just hearing it quickly uh, through everyone was, was really helpful as we, as we um, understand where to go from here. There's a lot to think about here for both NCA and NNA, but also other activities within USGCRP to given to, to not to Julie's point here. Um, and I do anticipate this will be applicable to people doing assessments across the world and across the nation as well. So thank you to the co-chairs and the vice chair and for those traveling, I think the side conversations were just as helpful. So really appreciate anything else you wanna add. That was much better than I had prepared. So I'm going to defer to you. Um, I guess I just want to say thank you also. Um, it was really, really helpful to be here. I appreciate that you met us where we are. Um, and I know that when we started this conversation a couple of months ago in the planning, I don't know that we were all on the same page, but I feel like you really listened to what we needed to hear and you gave us that and helped us think through it. So thank you for that. And um, one thing that Julie pointed out, I know I said I wouldn't say anything, but I can't not say anything. Um, <laughs> one thing that Julie said is that, um, you know, that she appreciated as a human learning about this process. And that made me think, not and I, I don't mean this isn't to to roll back all the process the progress we've made, but to say what do humans and and the people who participate in the in the assessment get out of it? And I think that that human relationship in the conversations, in the work, in the language, in all of that sort of nitty gritty of creating a key message and the traceable accounts and all of that stuff is part of our learning process as humans. And I think it's one of the draws of being an author. And Heidi and I have even talked about that as one of the things that the NCA offers as a climate service, that you learn so much from others through the process. And I just want to be sure as we move forward that we keep that value and that benefit. And that even if we move towards AI, we find a way to, to make sure that that doesn't get lost and that this is how we move forward together as humans and technology, you know, mixed together, but that both things come into play. So I just wanted to end like that. Thank you. So that's a, that's a great entryway into my final question back to you and a way to close out the meeting, which is how can we help you move forward? Um, what are the steps that we can be engaged with? And I, you don't have to answer right now, but just to come back and, and figure out like, you know, where where we can insert and help you along the way. Let's just say this is the beginning of a long relationship <laughs> um, and that I appreciate all the offering for additional support and help both online and offline and reminding us that we have a much larger network than just our team right. in-house. And, you know, we appreciate that. And, and I think that there's going to be a lot to talk about and consult about in the future. So I don't know, but soon. <laughs> good, good, good. 
And with that, we'll close out the meeting today. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thanks, everyone who's on uh, the Zoom call. Last line, Mr. Blanca. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. And um, so, so it's been it's been good to see everyone and safe journey back. Thank you. And so for Thanks, advisory everyone. committee members on online, uh, please stay on. Others, we're going to invite you out of the room because we're uh, we're moving into our final closed session. <laughs>